Today, um, I've been asked to talk about forest-based development. And that's what I have been working on for a long time. I'm a tropical ecologist. I'm a tropical forester. I really am into sustainable use. Um, and my whole career, I've been with communities with local people, rural farmers. And that's what I really like. So I really believe in that. I re believe in the democratic pro uh, processes of participation and um, transparency and those kinds of things. I really do think it's a, it's a way to go to do good management and with co-management in particular. It's, you know, the, the question is, this whole issue is about forest-based development. What does that mean? And so I, I was thinking about that in part because it can mean, you know, that you're going to develop the forest for sustainable purposes or somehow develop it. And so I went back and I was looking at a paper that we wrote years ago about acne and the forest government. And um, George Viana himself came up with these, this is what forest-based development looks like. And so you can see, looking at these different kinds of sustainability, the sort of thing you would expect if you look at a broad range of things. I think he also he had two more on there. One was ethical sustainability and something else. I can't quite remember what it was. Maybe, no, but, but, but these are the ones that really stood out to me that were meaning, meaningful, you know, not that ethical, but it was more like human property. But um, so thinking about that, and then I also want to go a little bit further and talk a little bit about neo-extractivism. This is a concept that um, Professor Hegel came up with. And these are some of the, the um, aspects that neo-extractivism considers. So it's basically this idea that the forest is way more than an economic source of income. It has all kinds of different things. It's a way of relating to the forest. And in particular, you know, it considers extractivists, um, rubber tappers, Brazil nut collectors, timber managers as assets. So the people that live there or live around there are considered assets. Um, builds on traditional ecological knowledge, but it also has these other things. It recognizes we live in a modern world and you cannot just sell raw products like these. That won't work. So it's pretty complex. And so today I'm gonna to talk about the role of Brazil nut. I know many of you are from the Amazon, you know what this is. This is a Brazil nut and this is the fruit. And so there's somewhere like between about 24 of these seeds or nuts inside of this fruit. <coughs> and I'll just put this here um, in case people want to look at it later. So, and so that's what I'm going to talk about mostly today. The role of this one species when we think about forest-based development at the center of the conversation a lot on some of the research that we've been doing over the years. And I started off with this. One of the things that's happened um, in the last few months, I would say, is that we were invited to submit an article for the Chico Legacy special issue on Brazil nut. And so I've been thinking about it a lot in that context. And one of the things I came across was this old um, writing from Cultural Survival by Jason Clay, who's kind of a, an economics guru. He works with World Wildlife Fund and he's been very instrumental in taking a market-based approach he's, to he's forest an anthropologist. products. He is an anthropologist, so he has more of a, um, a contextual background to be able to do this versus, you know, thinking he's not an economist, a pure economist. So this is what he said back in 1992. And when I ran across it, I was like, whoa, we, we actually know some of these things now from the work that has been gone, going on in those 30 years since she from this exactly. Um, we went online and we looked at, well, what have been because my perception is Brazil nut publications have really increased. We just went online and did a quick search in Web of Science. And these are just the number of publications from, you know, like 1988 all the way through 2017, I guess is what we look up. And they had the title, within the title was some version of Brazil nut or Amazonian nut or Amazonian nut. As people outside <laughs> of Brazil, they, they don't like to call it that. Not accurate. It's not accurate. <laughs> um, we call it Pará, Pará, it's not accurate as well. Yeah. yeah, we also look for that. <laughs> so, so you can just see, you know, that it's increased a lot and it's really reflective of the knowledge that we've gained. And what I'll talk about today is the research that we've been doing. And I say we, there's a whole group of us, but I really want to point out Lucia Bacci. She's my main collaborator. We've been collaborating 
since 2001, really, really closely. And so I consider she's, she's <coughs> just uh, incredible. And she works with Embrapa. Embrapa is sort of the Brazilian equivalent of the um, USDA Ag Research Station, except that Embrapa is much better endowed and much more um, on the forefront of research in Brazil than the USDA is here, for example. I have Rodrigo Sejano, who was a student at um, the Federal University of Ottawa, and he participated. Christy Stodhammer is another key, key individual. She was a biometrician here at UF. And unfortunately, she moved to Alabama, but we still, she still is our, one of our key, key collaborators. Um, and then I have a whole slew of students um, and one other professor who's worked with us. And I'm, I don't, I may have forgotten some people, but I don't think so. Jamie Cota, Amy Duchelle, Marlene Soriano, Vivian Seidemann, Todd Burwell, Eduardo Bonjolu, and Wendell Cropper is a modeling um, professor here. Shona and Kara are not on that list. They didn't work with Brazil. They worked with Timber. And that was a really great thing, too. And you will see how Shona, uh, how Kara has gotten into Brazil and is working in Peru after her doctorate. So I just want to kind of um, talk about that. And you'll see their research on here. So this species, um, Brazil nut, is enormous, for those of you who don't know it. It's an enormous species. It's a canopy emergent. It's one of the biggest in the forest, for sure, where we work. Um, and compared to other species, it contains a disproportionate amount of carbon. So that's become increasingly important as people talk about carbon sequestration and carbon storage in these tropical forests. It's extremely long-lived, you know, 400 plus years um, from some dating. Other dating puts it up to 1,000 years. Um, and the stature, structure, and longevity is linked to other species. No one's ever um, gone in and said how many species actually live on a Brazil nut tree, because I think that would be pretty interesting. But uh, there is a particular one that talks about these frogs that, that um, lay their eggs inside of these Brazil nut fruits. It's kind of a cool little paper. It is distributed across the Amazon basin. Um, and it's especially on uh, terra firme, which is dry land forest. So it's not in the Barzia region, region where all the rivers are. And some of its ecological characteristics just happen to be perfect to make it collecting. Um, it has this hard woody fruit that you see, um, which is really difficult to break into. So these, so what happens is that fruit is all the way up on the tree. It's hanging there and then it drops. And the opening at the top, if you could just point to that little hole opening at the top, right there, it's not big enough for the seeds to fall out. So those seeds are captured inside that heart until something intervenes. So that's, that. in that sense, it's, they're not all getting consumed really quickly. Um, it can take decades to reach reproductive maturity. And this is a paper from Todd Burtwell's um, master's work. And we were looking at um, two sites where we've collected data for many years. Um, and one site, he estimated that it took 83 years for a seedling to reach reproductive maturity. And another site, 167 years to reach reproductive maturity. So you can imagine these really dark forests. And if you can imagine the seedlings grow and then they just sit there and sit there. And then there's an opening. They grow a little bit more. And then the canopy closes up, so they slow down their growth. Maybe something falls on it, gets popped, and it sits there again. So it's, it's kind of these fits and starts in the forest setting. But in full sun, um, the tree actually that this fruit came off of was giving fruits in 20 years. So it's a whole different ball game, and that's very common with <coughs> species. They need full sun, they do much better. And we, we actually planted, yeah, we planted that tree. Um, for, as part of my dissertation. Fr fruits, of, fruits of your labor. Wow. Yes. <laughs> um, the other thing it does is it does resprout readily, as I was mentioning. Sometimes it gets topped even. This is, this is reasonably unusual for trees of that stature. When it gets topped, oftentimes it will sprout. This is not as unusual when it's a little seed. It can, you can, a, an ant can come or a cow can come and nip off the top and it'll re-sprout again. And that's because that seed is so large. It has lots of carbohydrates that can, can re-sprout. And this is the main dispersor that gets into that fruit. It's a rodent that's about this size 
and it has really great teeth and it's very, very efficient at getting into the, to the um, fruit. There's other species that also can get into it, but they're not near as efficient. Um, the agouti or dusty is really the main species um, in terms of um, dispersal and predation besides humans. Um, and agouti is another interesting thing is it really responds well to disturbance like many rodents and it's not a favorite game species, at least where I work. So that's also kind of helpful in terms of being able to keep the population healthy. Um, these are the flowers. They're, you can see from the finger here that they're pretty small. Um, they're, they're only about this big, but they are enclosed. So it takes a really large body bee, carpenter bees or bumblebee to get into it. It has to, it has to slip into that opening and then it goes in and pollinates. It's, it's hermaphroditic, which means the flower itself has the male and the female parts on it. It's a perfect flower. And it's mostly self incompatible. You, really, if the, you can't have the same flower pollinating itself. And even from the same tree, it's not very effective. So that's a really important characteristic as well. And it's um, harvested almost entirely from mature forest, which is really, really unusual. I'm like, you know, cashews or almonds or these other nuts that you can buy, these actually come from mature ultra forests in Kansas. And part of, part of that is, this is one of the reasons that it's such an important conservation species because it really requires, it's from that old growth forest that it comes. And so there have been a lot of, there have been several protected areas that have kind of hinged on the Brazil, that, that it's Brazil nut rich area because of that. Um, and I put has mostly resisted domestication. It's been interesting. There were some efforts to do plantations way back in the 70s, and they flowered and but they didn't really fruit very well. And we think it's partly because they're self incompatible. We think they uh, uh, sowed seeds from very, very few individuals. Um, another reason we think is because of the, the bees, because the bees, um, not that they can't fly really long distances, but they require mature forest to be able to. Um, have their reproduce themselves, including some of their mating processes require orchids, essence, essences from certain orchids, orchids. So that's one of the reasons we think that these plantations, these large scale plantations, like in old plant pastures, for example, they've never um, been fruitful. But in small settings on a small scale, if you're near a forest like this landowner here in Hondonia, you can see he's kind of proximate to an old growth into a forest. Then we think those, those small scale plantations will be fine, and we know they will be, really. So that's a little bit of a threat to its conservation status. Um, the other reason it's super important is because it's been so successful on the international market. Um, the first exports were sent from Belen in 1633. Um, by the mid 1800s, um, the port of Manaus was opened up and opened, and so if you can imagine, people began collecting Brazil nuts in this region, close to the mouth of the Amazon, and things opened up, they would go further and further into uh, out west. And it's a really important source of income um, for thousands of collectors like this one, and for lots of processors. And um, Amy Duchelle and, and um, recent work that they've done by Amy Duchelle and uh, Marlene Soriano showed up about up to 44% of total income of certain people who live in the forest. And that's mostly in Bolivia. In Peru and Brazil, they're less forest dependent. <laughs> um, and so much so, these, these things have really shifted. Um, you can see here we have three countries that are commercially, that commercially export and commercially produce Brazil nuts from mature forests. And in 1988, Bolivia wasn't even on the map in terms of exporting, but then that switched dramatically. Um, and I'll talk about why. Um, so one of the things that happened was that production shifted from this Belen port, and it was really a monopoly family that exported all the Brazil nuts for the most part. It shifted from there over to here in this region in Bolivia. Um, just, can I just interject, if you recall, Cynthia Simmons talked about deforestation of these Brazil nut groves in Pará. So that's part of why this happened. Mm -hmm. Good point. 
such that by 2013, 77% of net exports were from Bolivia. Really put it on the map. And so the, the deforestation in Eastern Amazonia is one reason. Another reason, this gentleman right here, is a private, um, a private in industrialist. I mean, he put up this beautiful state-of-the-art processing plant on the border with Brazil in Covita. And he, he had a, a loan. The, the company just outperformed all of its targets. It's just a real success story. They have really strict quality control. It's one of the things that happened was that the EU closed its markets to Brazil nut imports, to Brazilian Brazil nut imports, because the quality was not good enough. And so that was another key feature in why Bolivia, and Bolivia was sort of poised, okay, they took advantage of that closing. The US doesn't have a strict uh, market requirements, um, so we didn't close, but the EU did. And he was able to not only, you know, Brazil nuts are all organic, but he was also able to keep the certification going with certified organic. Um, and this is a figure I like to put up, and I, I, I'm sorry I don't have the year, but Bolivian forest exports, it's all the different kinds of wood, and it has a lot of great tropical wood in Bolivia, and the Brazil net exports. You can see how valuable it is even to the national economy in Bolivia. Um, and in Brazil, since 2016, three quarters of its harvest were sold domestically. So Brazil, in turn, said, we're going to develop our own market. And I put up that little sign with Cooperati because it's actually in Acre, this cooperative and Acre, this um, multi-level cooperative that has really taken the charge and led that process of selling and finding markets within Brazil. Very impressive group. And I like this too, because I found this on the web, like <laughs> Bolivia, it's, Bolivia, it's known for its Brazil nuts. I thought that was just so funny, just <laughs> proof. It's proof, it's on the world like that. <laughs> yeah, you can read all the other <laughs> So, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our evolving research efforts. You, you know very well from last week's presentation how rubber prices were plummeting, Brazil nut prices were going up over the years, and, and they've gone up really dramatically. And that's when I um, started developing, after the dissertation stuff, started developing a joint research um, program. Yeah. And our, our research questions evolved, incorporating and collaborating, you know, kind of how that goes. And this was really our first paper when we first said, well, what is the population structure of Brazil? Then? What does it look like out in the forest? Because uh, there's lots of reports from Eastern Amazonia that it occurs in groves. And so we wanted to, we didn't, I didn't experience that when I was in the forest in Acre. And so we actually mapped it and figured it out. And we had more of a random distribution within a 420 hectare plot too. This is one setting gal or one uh, rubber uh, land holding, rubber type of land holding. And another thing we got out of this paper, which is also you know, easy to believe, right, is that people who collect from these trees, they had very close, uh, their estimates of how much tree, individual trees produce was very highly correlated with what they actually produce. So we actually, nowadays, we've been counting fruits from trees in different places for um, up to 17 years in some cases. One of the theoretical pieces that we um, came out with, we weren't really sure how it would grow and how it produced. And this is led by Christy Stahan, the bionutrition I talked about. And this is trade-offs between growth and reproduction. So at the beginning, this is basal area increment. And so as the trees get bigger, um, as the, excuse me, as the trees get bigger and um, their growth is really high, get a really steep growth rate, and then it kind of tapers off as the tree goes into production. Trees start producing somewhere around 40 centimeters, something like that, 40 to 50 centimeters. And they peak when they're somewhere between 100 and 150 centimeters. These are enormous trees. And then they start to, when they start to senesce, they decline in production. So the biggest, biggest trees aren't the best producers typically. And uh, along the lines of theory, we're trying to nowadays figure out what's driving fruit production. And I put up this because this is in two of our sites in Filipinas and Cachoeira, and we have Production over time, and what stands out, right? We've been collecting the Filipinas for um, uh, 18 years, so we have a whole whole graph on that side. But we started collecting in Cachoeira in 2010, 
and look at that difference between those two sites that are 30 kilometers apart. And we also know that from people telling us. You know, some 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 landholders will say, hey, you know, I don't have a good area for production. It doesn't produce that well. And the densities are kind of close to the same. So this is this is production number of fruits um, per tree. And you see very diff large differences. And so we were really wanting to figure out what are, what's driving these differences between especially these two sites where we have lots of data. And one of the things that came up out of Vivian Zion's work, um, she worked in um, Western, more in, in he was in uh, in more the um, northwestern portion of Bolivia. And one of the things that she kept finding in terms of variation of fruit production is elevation kept coming up. You know how when you're taking GPS points, you automatically get elevation. And so we ran the we ran the models, and it's like elevation, elevation. We're like, what? You know. And so that's one of the curiosities that's been keeping us, and we've been asking people about that a lot. And we have some answers, but I'm not going to go into it because we haven't published that, and we don't really even know <laughs> quite yet. But we have some theories. So what about silvicultural options, which basically means manipulation options of the tree? What can you do? And what kind of management practices might we think about to enhance production? Because if people are really depending on for income, and I haven't, I haven't even talked about the cultural aspects, the social aspects that surround Brazil, and it has a whole nother set of aspects in terms of the use of the nuts and the use of the fruits and how people think about it and how people have legends about the individual trees. But what patterns of fruit production have emerged? That's one thing we wanted to know. And that was one of the questions Jason Clay was asking about. Um, how resistant Brazilian is the species to collection? So we're collecting, people are collecting the seeds, right? You don't get new trees if you don't have seeds in the forest. So are they collecting too much? That's been a question that's been out there forever. And how is Brazil not managed? And can more intensive management increase production somehow? So that's what I'm going to try to respond to. So this is from our Filipinas data. And to me, this what this represents is fairly constant production at the population level. This is a 420 hectare area. We collect from the same trees year after year after year. And to me, this indicates it's not perfectly you know, it's stable, but it's not a massed species where you have real high production one year and then it crashes. And then maybe four years later, another high production. It's fairly constant, which is why it's viable on the international market. You can count on it. But at the, um, at the individual tree level, it can vary quite a lot. Um, this is just based on five years of data, five years of production data. And we had 11 trees out of 140 that were always the best producers. They were pretty consistent. Five trees of those 140 that were huge, they, they were beautiful, great form, everything else they never produced in that five year period. And when we looked at the basics, about 25% of all trees produced almost three quarters of the production. So you have some really pretty high producers and others that are less good. And one tree, 140 fruits one year, 800 fruit, 801 the next. And that's, that's reasonable because you can imagine it takes typically a lot of energy to put up the fruits and then the next year it might not do as well. So some tend to do fine over the years. So we're trying to just look for patterns. The other pattern that we have looked at and noticed right away in this first five year data was that, pure, that um, pattern I told you about how the size, the diameter of the tree. So at the smaller diameters, it's just beginning production. It's in full production between 100 and 150 centimeters, dbh, which means diameter at breast height, just the diameter of the tree at this height, sorry. Um, and then at, when it starts to kind of begin to senesce, it gets smaller. And the other, you could put here, you could have diameter class or you could have crown size, totally correlated with each other. So that diameter, what it really represents is the stature of the tree. How much crown is there to sustain those really heavy fruits? The DBH, or diameter, is a really common measurement. You can do it really easy. Counting the size of the crown or figuring that out, it's not easy. <coughs> so we stick with diameter. But still, okay, so we've got these patterns that we were able to identify. How sustainable is Rizona extraction? Well, um, there was contradictory evidence. Um, in 2002, Peter Swedema out of um, uh, the Netherlands produced a great dissertation in which he 
put matrix models to a series of two small populations in Bolivia. And at about 93% collection rates, meaning they he estimated that the harvesters took about 93% of the seeds. Um, he said healthy structures, which basically means that you have a really good seedling and sapling level, uh, high levels of that, and then it tapers down because you expect to have lots more seedlings and saplings and then they die over time. But as long as you have individuals as they get bigger and bigger, you're good to go. So that's what he reported. And then there was a Paris paper in 2003 that suggests that I think it even use, uses demographic collapse in the article, where more where see um, where trees are more, more intensively harvested. And he looked at it was a meta analysis, and it was looking at um, trees bigger than 60 centimeters, and it was disparate data from different researchers. And um, we we also participated in that and, and produced gave some of our data, but we were a little more um, we were unsure of, of, we didn't necessarily agree entirely with the interpretation entirely, but it was, um, it's not like it was a poorly done study. It was lots of fancy statistics and it, the conclusions came out that there are, that maybe in some areas, though those trees are no longer producing or there's not enough, there's no seedlings and saplings, there's no smaller trees. And so the implication was people are harvesting too much. And this paper came out in science, and so it got out everywhere. And so we really felt the need to respond at a more local level too, and see, because that's not what we witnessed in our site, but on a, on a big scale, and a meta-analysis scale, that's what was reported. So we examined recruitment in three sites, recruitment meaning the seedlings that are coming up on the forest floor. And you can see our research design, and we looked at this site, Cachuera, that you've heard of, Filipinas, that you've heard of, and Pida Moyangaba. And this is, um, this is Rodrigo's work, and it's a really, it's a ton of work to look for these little seedlings that look like many other seedlings in the forest. But this is what he did um, with a lot of Ibrahim help, too. So what we found in those three sites, Filipinas, Cachuera, and Pida Moyangaba, was despite harvest intensities of our estimates of 71%, in the, in the uh, most intensively harvested um, place, we didn't find evidence of an, of an intermittent de uh, demographic collapse. We had those structures we were looking for where you have seedlings and saplings and they kind of tapered off in every case. And if you compare that to the Perez paper out of um, science, when they looked at the proportion of juveniles, here's the proportion of juveniles um, uh, that are 10 to 60 centimeters in diameter. You can see that Filipinas, about 50% of the population was that, that small, between 10 and 60. In Cachuera, 30%, and Pida got about 40. And according to the Paris article, these would be considered unharvested sites if you had those structures. And um, Cachuera would be considered uh, lightly harvested. So for us, that really signified, okay, we think we're doing fine. We think that people can collect. And one of the, um, so we kind of spread that message. Um, and because of Lucia Bacci's position, and she's really known as the Brazil Net Specialist in Brazil, so she gets invited to meetings and gets invited to policy forums. And she's in these little meetings where they determine rules and regulations and policies. And she said, I do not think we need to set aside areas. I think people can collect. They should be collecting because in, in her logic and in my our logic, you should be maintaining the forest by using it sustainably. We feel that this we felt that this was enough evidence to say that in our sites they're harvesting at a sustainable level. We felt like this was good enough evidence, and we'll show we have more evidence later <laughs> to show that we still think that's the case. And if but if you say don't collect in this area, well then all of a sudden they can't earn money off of that particular forest. So what are they going to do? That's the thought. So I really credit Lucy with getting that word out to the right people and keeping at bay regulations that we thought would have been harmful. So this is the Todd paper again, Todd Burtwell. Um, and he drew on this data that we had in these two sites and he did population matrix models with those two populations that we talked about. And his models definitely supported the uh, hypothesis that populations are stable 
at those collection rates of 38% and 81% is what you missed. Um, that, and that vital rates, meaning recruitment, growth, things may change dramatically from one year to another, but the population changes only gradually. You remember this is a really long-lived tree. So all you need to replace a really big tree that falls is one seedling to make it up from being a seedling all the way up to a big tree. So you can have 200 seedlings or you can have 5,000 seeds and you can collect all of them theoretically except one. And if it makes it, you've, you've replaced that tree that just stopped. That's what a major population model would come into that. Uh -huh. um, don't the little people like the next do some of them? Yeah. I will show you that some do, and they do indeed do, some do. Um, even though it's, it, 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 it's not a waste of time, but if it's not in a good site, it might be. <laughs> so from Todd's work, another key message um, that came out was, what's important is to maintain the mature individuals, the ones that are already producing, and the premature, the ones that are just about to produce. That's what we think is most important, rather than focusing on every seed. And that deforestation lane use change is the most pressing concern. Take out the whole lot, you definitely are going to have a reduction in the That was a cool study. So, um, what about the agouti? We know that the agouti and the humans are the, most, the biggest competitors for these seeds. And um, another student from the University Federal, that's who I didn't put up there, was Camila. Camila from um, Wufak also. Um, she tracked in her thesis, she tracked 6,000 over almost 7,000 fruits as they fell from the tree, which is very precarious work. She worked with another- um, Wear your helmet. Hard hat. Wear your helmet. <laughs> she worked with another Embrapa um, technician to do that. And so as the fruits were falling from 20 trees, she was going and labeling them and saying, okay, this one fell, this one fell, and to try and get a sense of how do they fall over time. And um, so she started tracking um, in 22nd of November, and um, I'm missing my budget, but I think, let's see. Pretty similar anyway. At this point, this is the fruits that are falling. Yeah, this is the number of fruits that have fallen. So this is the number of fruits that have fallen, and this is the agouti that's getting in right here, how they're being taken. And so we have the, um, the number of that were opened and removed, and then we have the number that are fallen. Can you, can you understand that on those two different um, uh, y axes? And so by the time in our particular area, in this particular um, collector, collects, he goes in at 15 of January, mid-January mid he goes in and collects. By that time, already 94% of the fruits had fallen, so there were another 6% left up in the trees, and the agouti had moved about 4% outside of the crown, because they were tracked, did it, is it still open underneath the crown, or did, if it went elsewhere, we just, it's removed from the area. Um, and underneath the tree, he opened 0.5%, or the agouti. And so, this is the way we interpret that, is that the agouti had weeks of unlimited seed access. So we're also concerned that the agouti has enough food during this high period. And just like other rodents, just like squirrels, what it does is it takes the fruits, sometimes buries the entire fruit. Most often, often it will open up the fruit and bury, eat some of the seeds and bury others. And just like squirrels, they forget them. And so it's really helpful to have those seeds buried when it has a certain dormancy. And also it puts it into contact with the soil. Um, you know, it's there, it's during the rainy season in Brazil nuts fall. So it's a, it's a perfect environment to germinate. It does have to go through, we think it's dormancy maturation or maybe it's breaking dormancy, chemical dormancy, we're not sure which kind, but it has a certain period, maybe a five, five to six months and it just has to break that dormancy. But then they're ready to, to um, germinate. The other thing we, um, in our calculations, um, the agouti consumed or dispersed 197 fruits or 3,351 3, seeds. So that's how much it um, consumed or dispersed during that period. That's sort of what we estimate. Um, yeah, so 
we feel like, okay, seems like the agouti, we, we, there's still questions in terms of the agouti. Is it, is it enough? Is it not enough? But we felt at least we've documented, at least in one case, what happened. Um, so this is some work from Amy Duchelle. And this, she did do her doctoral work on this. And Amy worked in three countries for her doctoral research. In Pando, Bolivia, that all neighbor each other. Pando, Bolivia, Acre, Brazil, and Madre um, de Dios, Peru. And she, she asked um, collectors, Brazil not collectors, harvesters, you know, what are your practices? What do you do? Do you map your stand? Do you have a management plan? Do you enrichment plant? Do you actually put plant seedlings themselves? Do you protect the seedlings in agricultural clearings? Or do you um, protect them in forest clearings, kind of liberate the seedlings? Do you cut vines off the trees? Do you avoid bleeding the trees? So one of the things that happens with Brazil nut, it's got a really red sap. And so some people, some collectors, they will bleed the tree, they call it, where they'll make a gash and the tree will bleed. I'll explain why they do that. And then on the harvesting side, do you remove the placental tissue? It has a little piece inside that's kind of icky. And if you, if you want to keep, you want to give clean nuts when you produce them. You want to hand over clean nuts to the buyer. So did you remove the placental tissue? Did you remove the cut or damaged nuts? Because they harvest them with a machete. Some of them are cut. Um, and you want to take those out too. Did you transport the same day as collection? Did you dry your nuts, which also is buyer's like? And did you separate them from contaminants, meaning did you move them away from kerosene or use pesticides or herbicides? And so this is what, these are the different management practices she was looking at. And it really varied in those three countries. And I want to highlight the ones that, um, that were significantly different. So um, some of the management reflected uh, certification, either organic, fair trade, or even green certification. Because in Peru, they were, they were doing, in, in all places they were doing, um, not all places, but most places they were doing organic and fair trade. And in Peru, they were actually doing FSC certification of these nuts at the time. And these are the practices that certified producers completed more often than non-certified. So you can kind of see in this case where certification kind of had some effect, especially on this management end on terms of the harvest, because that's what buyers really want. They want clean stuff. And over here is interesting, the map and the management plan, because look at this, Peru is way up, right? And that's because the FSC certification, they require a management plan and they require mapping. So that was interesting too, to see how that played out. And there's another one that, um, this is the Peru, yeah, with the FSC certification. And the other one was this avoid bleeding tree. So if you make a gash, if you even harm a tree, if one of these pines out here, and this is what people do actually too to produce seeds sometimes, is, is it, it reacts like it's being wounded, like it's going to potentially die if you want to put it in anthropomorphic terms. So it'll produce more seeds and fruits. It'll just go, oh, well, you know, I've got to put out all the reproduction I can. And Brazil nut trees will do that. So it's logical to want to gash it or to bleed it. And a lot, some producers do that. And FSC said, don't have them bleed the trees because it's a pathogen entry point. You could damage the tree to where it will no longer produce. But I have to say that we're still quite curious about, would that be okay to try with trees that don't produce well at all? You know, we, don't, we hate to support um, a, a practice that might be harmful because we don't really know, but we're really curious because some producers in other regions They'll swear by it, you know, but it would take a long time to uh, monitor and see if, yeah, a lot of bleeding and a lot of <laughs> monitoring for bugs and things like that, you know, pathogens. But um, I thought that was pretty interesting, too, that in Peru they got the message, you know, don't bleed the trees. And uh, Karen, why didn't, for example, the other sites adopted a certification? Because since it's a, a very uh, hidden market, yeah, and certification could help you know, to channel production. Why did they yeah. embrace? I remember in Acre they did, and in Bolivia I, I just don't remember. I don't think they were in that at that time frame that they were able to access that. 
Bolivia is, uh, is more, was more, certainly more isolated at the time of her study, and it kind of continues to be more isolated than the other two, especially with the oceanic um, highway that goes from Brazil now to the Pacific. But, but many producers, they just don't, they, if, if you're not organized in a cooperative or something, it's really hard to get that certification because they bring certifiers up, they have to know you exist. And there's still a, a market for it. Yeah. And, and also it's a low impact uh, management compared to uh, timber or other sources. So there might be. It is, it is. But it, also you have to be organized in order to do yeah. it. You know, it's just another little thing. Or, yeah, because there are mm -hmm. costs associated. There are costs associated. If you've already got a ready market, maybe it doesn't seem like it's not just a one-time cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to continue to recertify. Right. But organic and fair trade certification is much easier than the certification. So they will go for that way before they'll go for FSC. Okay. And, and actually, the Peruvians dropped FSC certification soon after the study was done. Is it all of the Brazil that organic? They all are organic. Okay. They're so just not just necessarily all certified. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So don't fool as consumers. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other interesting thing I wanted to point out here is with Bolivia, and this is transport the same day as collection. <coughs> and you can see that in Bolivia, they tend to do that. In, in Madre de Dios, they also did it to a certain extent. And in Aki Brazil, not so much. And the reason was is Bolivia is so force dependent, but so Brazilian dependent for an income, that theft was occurring where people would go in and take the nuts of others. Not necessarily even their neighbors, but maybe other people who credit them. And, and it, even in, uh, and, and so it has to do with kind of tenure security and your ability to um, keep people out of your areas. And in Acre, they're actually now doing that. They're, there now have been reports of some thefts because the prices have gone up so much earlier. For land tenure differences too, but in Peru, they're concessions. Mm -hmm. So it's not sort of people who live there and have their areas. That's right. <clears throat> and in Bolivia, they have different ways of collecting too. In Bolivia, they go ahead and camp and collect and collect. And in Acre, like Mary Ann's talking about, they're just in their houses and they'll go back for the day. That's quite different. But it depends on where, where you are. So that was a super interesting part of one part of Amy's study. Um, so we also wonder, well, what about could you enrichment plant? Could you that seed in there? What would happen if you cut these lianas or these woody vines off the tree? That was one of our first questions. And what if you did tend the regeneration in certain places? So this is this is um, research results from my dissertation in which we looked at seedlings that we planted in forest gaps where they naturally occur, in pastures within um, protect, uh, extracted reserves or sustainable use areas, and in shifting cultivation plots where they're growing rice and corn at first and then beans and then any up and then they abandon. So we planted seedlings in all those places and we measured these different um, variables and how they were available and we saw that light water and nutrients were all limited in the forest gaps. In the pasture, they were pretty available. Um, and in the shifting cultivation plots, they were available and the nutrients in particular were abundant. Why were the nutrients abundant in the shifting cultivation plots? Well, the training of the, the trees or the, the crops that were there? It's because when they prepare the shifting cultivation plots, they cut down the vegetation and then they burn it. So all that ash and all the nutrient pulse is terrific and the soil still retains it. Indeed, that's why in the pasture it was still available. Even though they'd abandoned it and put pasture, those nutrients were still available. What was also surprising to me at least was the water was really limited because if you walk in a forest from the, from the outside and you walk in the forest, you feel like, oh, relief. It's so much cooler. It just feels so much fresher and you're refreshed. So why was water limited and you know as it as it is the water really from from the dew every night is intercepted the upper canopy so it doesn't come down to the seedlings that's one thing the seedlings themselves were really small in the um, forest forest gap plots and so they don't have many roots they can't really access the water very well so there's various characteristics yeah and and a rubber tapper woman helped me think this through yeah, so these are, what do, what do you think? What are your hypotheses? <laughs> um, 
And, and from a socioeconomic perspective, in the forest gap, it required some work. In the pastures, it required tons of work to maintain those seedlings. And in the shifting cultivation plots, it was barely anything because they're hoeing their crops anyway. So they were perfect places, really, in these shifting okay. cultivation plots. I saw uh, during my research that we can see uh, the grow from the uh, rain trees. Uh -huh. uh, the sun, the, when the area open, we can see the growth. You can actually Large. see. Yeah, we uh -huh. can see, like you are seeing the growth in the forest gap. Because yeah. they need to work release in our world. That's right. So, so I don't know if you can, got what CNMR is talking about, but you know how trees have growth rings, right, as they grow. And, and CNMR was one of the first people in that paper where y'all, they documented, well, you can actually see it in Brazil nut trees too. Not because in, 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 in the U.S. or in, in temperate zone, you have growth rings because you have the fallows that you have the winter, and then there's the summer. They're growing like crazy in the summer, and then they shut down. And in the tropics, people said, oh, growth rings don't exist. But these guys looked, and in the rainy season, they expand, and in the dry season, they're really tiny growth rings. It's really cool. We, in, in that growth and um, production study that we did, we, we put um, a dendrometer bands on the trees, so you monitor really precisely how much growth is going on, and we could see shrinkage during the dry season, where they would shrink. And cool, cool science stuff. <laughs> um, and so, tasty. And tasty. <laughs> yeah. We have Brazil nut the last last call. Should have bought more. <laughs> um, so one of the things we definitely saw was that lianas affect production. Um, this is, these are lianas, these woody vines, and you can see how messy it can be, trees. And the way we looked at it, because the lianas on the trunk, that, that doesn't matter, that's not going to affect anything, but it's up in the crown. If it gets in the crown, um, you can imagine it's covering the leaves, it, they can't photosynthesize it much, as much. If they're really heavy lianas, they break those branches, it can really damage um, the branches, and it'll damage the fruits, the, seed, um, the uh, flowers and the fruits as well. So we looked up on these crowns and we said, okay, this tree doesn't have any, to be honest. This one has less than 25% of the crown covered. This is 20, between 25 and 75 and above 75. And so you can tell from here in the bean fruit production per tree, right, that those with, with hardly, without lianas and with barely less than 25% covered, they produced better than those that had significant liana loads. So we were really happy to be able to, to document that. Not that this is, harvesters tell us, harvesters tell us this stuff all the time, and we just document it. We quantify it, and then we get tenure. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a partnership. <laughs> um, and the other thing that we really wanted to look at was if Liana cutting then to what extent it improved the trees. Because we figured if you get rid of them, it should, they should do better, right? So in 2002, we had trees that were cut and not cut for, for lianas or vines. In 2002, we didn't see any difference, which we didn't expect because the fruits take 14 to 15 months to mature. Um, 2003, still no difference. Surely in 2004, but we still didn't see any difference. And in 2005, still nothing. Um, but in 2006, which was the year after a drought year, we actually saw a difference where if you cut the lianas, you have um, better fruit production than if you don't cut them. And then you can see how the trees just get better and better over time, where you get a bigger and bigger difference if you cut the lianas. So there's without a doubt a difference. And what we found and what we observed is that when you cut the lianas, what happens is these new branches start to form which you get rid of them. It takes them a whole year for the lianas to fall because they're woody and they're sticking up there and, and the top of the canopy, and then it just starts to form new branches. And at first they're little, so they can't hold that many fruits. And then as they grow and mature and get um, thicker, they can hold more fruits. And we also saw, in some cases, if you didn't cut the lianas, the tree would actually die. So eventually, it can't have enough photosynthesis, you can't sustain all that. So that was a, a really interesting study that we got out of this too. This is Jamie Coda, and she looked at 
regeneration in fallow fields. So after you abandon those shifting cultivation plots for a while, people, the collectors would tell us, well, you'll see there's more seedlings and saplings in fallows than in the, the native forest where we, where, they're, where we typically look for them. And sure enough, she was able to quantify that there were more seedlings in fallows than in the, um, than in the mature forest. And similarly, there are more saplings, so a little bit bigger, trees up to 10 centimeters. So these are little guys, you know, up to 1.5 meters in height, and these are bigger, the saplings up to here. So she found this, and why do you think that would be? Why would you have more seedlings and saplings and saplings than in the forest? Light, that's one of the big reasons, and she actually measured light. I'm not gonna show the data, but it showed, you know, how much better light, why else? has to do with some of the other stuff that I showed you from the enrichment planting stuff, right? Nutrients. Nutrients. We think still it had a little bit of a nutrient but boost, perhaps, and less competition, uh, maybe from water. The other thing we know is that agoutis love that sort of tangly stuff that's in fallows, and you definitely see more fruits in those fallow areas than you do in, in the forest. Here, follow it. Capoeira. Yeah, yeah, I should have said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's just capoeira. Okay. Yeah. Other fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so Eduardo, who's doing his master's now, his project is he's going to um, project what kind of Brazil nut production could you get from fallows over time. And so he's looked at all these different, like some, uh, these are pasture areas, but he's looking at one site and he's going further to kind of quantify how many seedlings and saplings do you find in fallows of different ages? And everywhere from like 12 years all the way up to fallows that are 60 years old. And then he's gonna try to project what, what kind of nut production, if you just left that fallow, didn't, didn't convert it to pasture or something else, what would happen in terms of Brazil nut production? So that's what he's working on for his masters in here. He's um, in his second field season, he took back some of the results and was taking them back to a producer to say, this is how many seedlings you had. And, and virtually every one of the producers that he took a list back and the map, they said, I can't believe that many. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shift it to pasture for sure. <laughs> you know, it was kind of that sort of reaction. Not that they didn't know that there were some, but they were always surprised by the number. So we look forward to hearing his results. Um, this is another study, and, and I didn't put Allison on the list. This is from Allison, another UFOC student, and he is um, kind of a geospatial expert, and he did mapping. What he did is he went with a harvester, followed him on his, all his Brazil collection trails, and then they uh, exhaustively searched for all the large trees. And he found that the harvester collected from 70% of all the reproductive adults. So there were 30% that he didn't collect from. Because what happens is it's really easy to just keep doing the same thing year after year after year and not really looking for new trees that now have entered into production. That's one of the, one of the things. Um, and we know that not all produce well, so it makes sense to not, not visit each one. But when he took that data and then he projected using our estimates of this, these variables, if you don't have vines, if you have a good crown, and blah, 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 of the um, 30, so 32 new ones were identified with good crown quality and no lianas. And he estimated that if he added it to his routine collection route, he could increase production by almost 30%. And um, so that was, that was pretty interesting study. And just a side note, the extractivists that had this map and had done this used this map as collat. He said, "This proves to you, at a bank." He said, "This proves that I have. I'm, produ I'm producing on my land, and that's what allowed him to get a loan." He went at first, and they said, "Give me the names. Give me the, the number of cattle and how many you have." And he said, I, "I don't have cattle." And they said, "Well, we can't give you a loan. You can't demonstrate that you have resources." And so he actually took this map. He thought, "Let me take this map." And he got one. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Smart people. Um, the selective logging damage, and I won't go into this Kara too much because this is some of Kara's work, but uh, she found in one of their studies that 80%, so they were looking at, the question is, can you do both logging and whistling? That's a question that keeps coming up. 
too. Um, and CARA found that um, of the 80% of the 500 adults that they inventoried in Peru, 80% um, were at least 100 meters away. So for me, that signals they're really avoiding um, damaging resilient trees. That's what that signals to me because they lost the, the trees, the stumps that they found were way far away for the majority. Another paper by Manuel Guariwata showed clearly an FSC certified concession. So you can imagine that the logging is done in a sustainable way. You know, they're being quite careful because it is illegal to fell a resilient tree in all three of those countries. Um, and it also showed low damage to those existing resilient trees. So we, we often say that at small, low intensities and um, that we think it, it's probably pretty compatible with logging if you're very careful with it. It all depends on the care that you do with the logging. One of the questions we do have though is, do, is there any extra wind risk if you have logging gaps? We think with pasture, we've kind of, that's been our anecdotal observations if they're next to a pasture um, or next to a, a big plot with ag fields that you could get some wind damage where they fall over. I don't know if you've ever observed that. Oh, uh, the professor, uh, mm -hmm. um, he, uh, I saw management or some management uh, in a area. So uh, I remember that he told that it's good in all sense that you have a little one man kind of management. Yeah. Or if yeah, he's done some really nice work. They did a meta-analysis too where they showed damage to biodiversity. They, they had indicators of damage to biodiversity carbon. And it, it showed relatively limited in, in sort of these well-managed forests. Yeah, I mean, we know it does something. We know you can't have everything, right? But in our case, too, we think, you know, opening up a gap is not a bad idea maybe for results improvement. But these are just some of the things that people ask about a lot and we just try to present some evidence. And um, Marlene Soriano, from Bolivia, she tackled it from a, a recruitment perspective. So she looked at, um, in, in Bolivia, places that were on forests that were unlogged with Brazil nuts, and places where they had, they had legal permits to log, called formal, <laughs> and informal means illegal, they didn't have permits to log. And um, she didn't find that between those sites in general, there was no difference in Brazil nut recruitment in those three sites. When she looked, though, at the, the different logging areas, so where you fell the tree, where it falls over, where you skid it out of the forest, um, and in the log landings, and she compared that, with, she found that in the log landings had the highest densities of Brazil nut um, seedlings. Again, this idea that kind of high light, right? And I just put that up to you because that's a, just looking for seedlings, whatever you do, don't do that for your dissertation. It's a <laughs> lot of work. <laughs> Um, so, in our opinion, kind of the key constraints are not ecological, but they're more socioeconomic, and they're being they're being tackled. In my opinion, there are best management practices. People actually do a lot of people do on a cutting nowadays. A lot of people try to do improved nut storage because that's what the buyers are demanding. Um, and in all these three regions, there's best practices manuals and, and there's workshops and those sorts of things. Um, and these green, I would say green not so much now, but fair trade and organic certification are coming more and more on board. And the big deal, and they, these aren't exactly today's prices, but Brazil nut prices have gone way up. And that's been a fantastic thing to get people enthused, of course, because um, that's one aspect. Economics is not everything by any stretch, but it's an important part. And so I just want to kind of close with, um, we try to disseminate our findings, findings widely um, by all kinds of different means. We go back to the forest communities and other forest communities periodically. And last year we had, we had so much fun going back to different communities and um, giving our results, basically going through this presentation, but we use flip charts and it's, it's really, I would do that if we had them here, use the flip charts, because then they kind of stay on the wall 
and you can go back and refer to them. And it's, we have such a good time talking to people who, this is what they do as part of their living, right? And so they know all kinds of stuff. And we tell them, we share some of our findings and some of them are surprised at, others not. They don't know what happened in Bolivia or what happened maybe in another place. So those interactions are a lot of fun for us. And this one totally cracked me up. We were with a group of Apurinas, socio-environmental agents. They were going through uh, their own training workshop. And they invited us to come in for the talk. And they're like, you need something. It's something. I'm like, oh, this is like my uh, girls, you know. <laughs> they know how to do it. They know who to be in the front. <laughs> Which for me is you know, not as automatic. <laughs> um, that's kind of it. And I just wanted to just acknowledge everybody, especially main collaborators and um, the Embrata crew that works a lot with 